Okay, I think it's about four minutes after the hour, so it's about time to get started here. Uh, welcome to the uh, MIDAS webinar. Um, our talk today is assembly of the first multi-scale ensemble COVID-19 uh, model. Uh, my name is Harry Hockheiser from the MIDAS Coordinating Center. I'm going to be your host and I'm going to introduce our panelists in just a moment. As I mentioned beforehand, this uh, um, webinar is being, um, uh, it does have interpretation in, in Spanish available. So if you need that, you can hit the button at the bottom of your screen. And I'm going to um, just give a brief overview. We have three speakers today and they're each gonna go for about 15 minutes. Um, and so I wanna tell you about a tiny bit about each speaker and then I'll let them get to it. As soon as my machine get, lets me pull up that, uh, um, that page. So um, since I'm having a little bit of trouble with that, I'm gonna just ask if um, Filippo will uh, give me a little bit of forbearance and introduce himself and get started and then we can go from there. Sure. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening. I don't know. It depends. Um, so I'm, my name is Filippo Castiglione. Shall I start sharing my screen? Sure. Um, so, um, so I am uh, uh, a computer scientist which started to be involved in the simulation of the immune system uh, years ago. And uh, uh, today I will be talking about if I manage to share the screen. Yes, should be this one. Uh, I will be, do you see my screen? So I will be telling you about a model um, I developed to simulate the infection, SARS-2 uh, infection virus and um, the time evolution of, uh, of the disease, COVID disease, and how uh, this model allowed to derive an age-dependent mortality uh, function, basically, which uh, will be used uh, uh, as uh, we'll, you will see in the next uh, uh, few presentation in another model. So the, um, to start with, uh, the, um, we know that COVID-19 has a very variable clinical presentation. Some people are asymptomatic, other people go to the intensive care and they have a very severe uh, disease course. And it's not really clear the reason of this uh, high variability. Mortality is also very variable, ranging from 0.5 to 13%. Uh, one thing that is uh, of now very well uh, assessed is the fact that there is a clear dependence uh, of the mortality rate with um, to the age, so that uh, uh, elder people are more likely to die if they get the virus. Now, um, definitely this variable variability in the clinical presentation uh, uh, needs to be seen or needs to be derived from two uh, class of factors, what uh, I call the host factors and the pathogen factors. So either uh, it depends on the host, uh, on the immune system response of the host or uh, some, uh, somehow to the genes uh, which uh, uh, derive and, and drive the immune response to the, to the virus of, from the host or what is called the immunology of history. So um, we know that the immune system uh, acquires a certain shape in the diversity of the clones which are patrolling our body. And this is uh, uh, acquired and, and changes during the lifetime due to a continuous exposure to viruses. So uh, there might be, uh, uh, as usually, the uh, dependencies on the immunological Recording history. Recording in progress. The other uh, factor, of course, uh, comes from the virus itself. There are a number of um, variables which uh, determine uh, how uh, virulent the pathogen is. For example, the transmission, the, the spread within the host, 
the ability to enter the cells, what's called the trophism, and the, the replication rate, and so on and so forth. So on, on the basis of this consideration, we uh, developed the computer simulation model to create a virtual cohort, what it's now called, uh, to perform an in silico trial, basically, to understand uh, how uh, host and pathogen factors influence the disease uh, development and therefore the final outcome. The model we've been used is, uh, is an old model, is a computational agent-based a stochastic model which includes a, a lot of features of the immune system. These are the agents or the uh, entities represented in the model. There are cells, lymph, uh, uh, lymphocytes and myeloid cells, and there are uh, a number of cytokines, interleukins, or signaling molecules that cells use to communicate and cooperate. And the model account for a number of different possible antigen like vaccines or viruses or bacteria or cancer. It includes a, a long list of immunological features. Each of this is coded in a certain way. Um, of course, uh, each uh, is part of the algorithms uh, which consist in this architecture and uh, they can be turned on and off and they uh, allow uh, to customize the model to study different uh, pathologies. For instance, have been used in this model to study diabetes or type two diabetes actually, or other infections like uh, Epstein-Barr virus infections, HIV and so on. Um, now, the model is complex, so I will not tell you too much due to the time constraint, but what is important is the fact that we modify this model to account for those two features we wanted to um, study. So the immunological features uh, were tuned uh, introducing a concept of immunological competence, which is a parameter uh, which basically uh, correlates linearly with the age and which we use to tune the immune, let's say, ability, the, the ability of the immune system for to, to, to respond promptly to a, a certain pathogen. The uh, correlation coefficient has been, let's say, tuned on uh, uh, to reproduce a certain thing that I will tell you in a second. So with this parameters I see, basically we modify both the innate uh, immune response and the adaptive immune response in these two specific ways. The innate immune response basically is uh, the ability of presenting cells like macrophages and adrenic cells to phagocytize the, the virus and to present to the adaptive immunity so that it will start a recognition and uh, uh, you know, an adaptive immune response producing antibodies and cytotoxic cells. So by means of these parameters I see, which decreases with age, we basically down-regulated the phagocytic activity in elder people, basically. For what concerns the adaptive immune response, we basically changed what is called the normal reference range of cells. It, there is a formula which link the, the uh, normal uh, white blood cells distribution in the blood. And uh, we, since we know that there is a relationship with age uh, there is this concept of immunosenescence, we reproduced exactly the same thing by multiplying again, the let's say the number of lymphocytes per uh, uh, multiplied by this uh, immunocompetence parameter. So an immunocompetent, uh, immuno, let's say, uh, 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 an elder, uh, all the people has an immune response which is less prone to respond quickly. On the side of the virus, two characteristics have been uh, modeled as a variable. And the first is the infecting viral load, basically the number of particles at time zero of the simu simulation, which is known to um, have a strong impact on disease course. And the second is the, uh, the trophism or the ability of the virus to enter the target cells, which in for SARS are epithelial cells and uh, basically which have this uh, we know this receptor ACE2 on, on the surface. So 
the this probability basically drives the speed or the speed of the uh, of the beginning of the infection how if the if this probability is high the virus will uh, start to proliferate sooner and therefore the it, it is considered more virulent in this respect now the model is then uh, it, it, it has a dynamics of different variables. So you can see here kind of a movie showing how the dif different cell counts change in time. And we followed therefore a number of, uh, a high number of uh, virtual patients for 30 days, 30 days from the infection, uh, time zero is the infection uh, of, uh, of, of the host. So by varying, uh, different, this IC, all this characteristic, the immunocompetence and the uh, viral load and the uh, trophism to, uh, to the target cell, we reproduced a number of uh, progression of the disease. And uh, then we classified or we stratified this virtual patient on the basis of the viral load at the day 30 with the rationale that if a patient has at day 30 a high viral load, it can be considered, let's say, in danger. I mean, the situation is critical, which is somehow, of course, related to the likelihood of dying, basically. It, this is the assumption we do. And we observe the very variable uh, dynamic uh, dynamics of the uh, all variables. What it's important is to look at the viral load. As I said, we have, for example, these red curves which show in log scale the viral load uh, for what we call critical patients, so person who have a viremia at uh, day 30, which is above a certain threshold. There is another class of, of uh, virtual patient which uh, doesn't clear the virus and it's represented here by this blue curve uh, and this goes on for a number so it is like if the immune system and the vir virus reach a kind of a stable state and this class includes what we call the asymptomatic although we have uh, not defined what a symptom is because uh, it's more complicated to this stage i mean we did it but not in in, in, the, in the present presentation and of course, the last category of people are those the lucky who clear the virus and bring the baremia to zero. So with this study, the, the, the way to tune the parameter was to, um, to reproduce the distribution of uh, uh, casualties, uh, so which is age dependent. And uh, so those four parameters basically have been uh, uh, tuned to reproduce uh, this kind of distribution. A anything else is a byproduct, which we are happy about because it has a certain agreement with reality. We were able to reproduce a number of, say, fact like the time of viral peak or the uh, time of antibodies peak. I mean, many uh, observation of the model are in agreement with or in partial agreement with reality and other are more important, like the fact that the viral, initial viral load correlates with disease uh, progression, which is somehow expected uh, as, a, as we uh, learn from the literature. Other uh, reproduced factors are, for example, the fact that IL-6 correlates with disease severity. I'm not spending too much time on this uh, figures, and the last is that uh, interesting fact is that the humor response is more important than the cytotoxic response, as we can see the viral, the, the, sorry, the um, antibodies load uh, at day 30, it's uh, uh, higher in recovered people than in uh, uh, critical people. So if, if they, and the body response is strong, then the likelihood of recovering from the disease is high. So basically the model is able to reproduce the broad spectrum of uh, 
symptomatic presentation of COVID-19. And it basically says that there is no reason to, uh, you know, call for strange genetic, of course, there will be genetic factors as we will learn with time of this infection with this pandemic. But it's not a necessary condition. It's at least the, 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 the simulation says that uh, it is enough to have uh, stochasticity and a difference uh, in uh, viral load and immunocompetence to reproduce and recover this high variability. Now, coming to the, uh, the, the important thing which link my presentation to the next is that uh, since we had this about 10,000 virtual patients, we were able to, uh, and by using the stratification with age, we were able to come up with the model of uh, mortality, basically a function which linked the time uh, and uh, uh, the fraction of people in silico people who die. So this is the function which, is, uh, which has this factor in the front. Uh, it is a sigmoid function basically, which has this factor in front, which comes from the age distribution of casualties. So it's a parametric in three parameters, A, B, and C, and by fitting this uh, uh, numbers coming from the uh, simulation, we came up with, uh, um, uh, let's say, parametric family of curves, of sigmoid curves, which uh, can be then used as a mortality model, as Jacob will tell you in the next uh, slide. So I think uh, I wasn't too quick, and uh, I, I, I finished my presentation, basically. Great, great. Thank you. Um, we've got a mi minute or two for a couple of questions. If anybody has any questions for Filippo, please uh, yeah. type them into the chat or the Q&A. And if we don't have anything right now, we will go on to the next presenter okay. um, and take questions at the end. Sure. Okay, hearing no questions, I want to pass to, to Lucas Butcher, uh, who is a, a research scientist at UCLA. Lucas, please uh, take it away. Yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the uh, invitation. Um, I also want to talk, um, so that's uh, like a good connection where um, Filippo just finished his presentation because um, like I want to talk a bit about um, mortality or COVID-19 mortality and how one can use or combine excess staffs and testing statistics to get better estimates or improve estimates of COVID-19 mortalities. And large parts of these um, works that I'm presenting right now uh, were done in collaboration with Feng Cho and Maria Dosonia and Ming Tao Xia from UCLA and CSUN. And there are basically two parts uh, of my presentation. In the first part, I wanna talk about um, more like population level uh, dynamics or population level features, not um, like uh, Filippo's talk. Uh, I don't want to focus so much on the cell dynamics. And in the second part, I also want to uh, present a PDE model, an age structured PDE model that can account for um, like time since infection dependent uh, transmissibility and recovery time profiles. And this also connects my presentation to Jacob's work. And okay, so let's get started with the mortality measure part. And I think that all of you are probably quite familiar with some of the standard mortality measures like the CFR that can be calculated by dividing the total number of reported deaths by the total number of cases. And like one issue, or there are several issues with this, measure one issue is that there's a time delay between um, these two quantities that you're uh, dividing. And the other issue is that you're not accounting for the total number of deaths and uh, like infections in a certain jurisdiction. Um, you, you can um, basically correct the time delay between um, the total number of reported deaths and cases by using this measure, M, and you see that uh, in these two panels that for like different outbreaks, also if you're comparing across different jurisdictions, M is more stable than DCFR and it's usually 
kind of a better measure to, um, to track like this kind of estimate. It's not really, um, not really a good mortality measure, but it's a, it's a relatively stable estimate. And, and if you are interested in the like actual um, probability of dying from a certain disease, um, it's usually um, related to this quantity, the IFR, the infection fatality ratio. But there are also many different problems related to the IFR because again, there's like a certain delay between these two quantities. Um, then it's also not that easy to uh, really estimate the total number of infections. There are like measurement errors, false positive, false negatives, testing bias, biases, uh, reporting delays, processing delays. And, and then there are also many other issues, for example, different uh, definitions of mortality. If you compare, for example, Italy, and the United States, or other countries, they, um, for example, in the United States, the CDC uh, officially states in their documents that we shouldn't compare uh, like their death counts across different states or jurisdictions because their processing delays. Um, it also depends what kind of definition one uses to track COVID-19 deaths. And one possibility to at least um, correct for some of these issues is to um, incorporate access death statistics in um, these mortality measures that one wishes to estimate. And this graphic is just showing like one way to calculate um, access uh, death mortality for certain jurisdiction, you're taking the historical mean and you're um, just uh, taking the difference between the currently observed mortality and the historical mean to get an estimate of um, like the probably significant uh, excess deaths in a certain jurisdiction that was uh, hit by COVID. And one like um, one example where you can clearly see like a significant number of access deaths is New York City. And if you compare the uh, reported COVID-19 deaths with access deaths between March 10 and December 10 of last year, you see that there is a relatively large gap between these two numbers. And the um, New York City Health uh, Administration also published something they called probable uh, COVID-19 deaths but I think that the gap was still relatively large. Um, and that's not only true for New York City, it's also um, like the case for many other uh, states or like countries all over the world. And that's also something that is quite helpful uh, to know if one constructs models like uh, the model that Jacob is working on, because then it's also possible to better estimate certain parameters in these uh, ensemble simulations. So that's one connection. Um, but there are also countries where these differences are relatively small. For example, Switzerland uh, was able to uh, track their COVID-19 deaths relatively well. So if you're comparing these two numbers, it's just between March and November of last year, but also like recent numbers also line up quite well. And um, for Germany, it's kind of the same situation. They were also able to track uh, COVID-19 deaths uh, relatively well uh, over the last year. So the difference between access deaths and co reported COVID-19 deaths was um, like small and falls within the um, confidence interval. Now, as I said, there are also other examples um, in the United States, um, this gap is relatively large. Um, there were also recent reports by um, different modeling organizations that you're probably all aware of. Um, but there are also examples uh, like Peru or Ecuador, where the gap between reported COVID-19 deaths and excess deaths is even larger, uh, up to a factor between two and three, um, which is important to know if one, as I said, uh, wishes to estimate certain uh, mortality measures. For example, for these two countries, it would be more reasonable to directly take excess deaths um, in, uh, into account for these uh, mortality measures that I presented before. 
And here's another way of um, illustrating these differences if all access deaths um, and confirmed deaths would be similar in these countries, um, they would fall onto the uh, solid black line. But we see that for many countries like Mexico or Russia, the difference is uh, quite large. And <clears throat> for the United States, we found that there is a gap of about like between 10 and 20%, depending on if one takes um, like certain states with reporting delays into account or not. And this also um, is quite well aligned with other recent studies that were focusing on this aspect. And I, I won't go into um, much more detail um, because of uh, these time constraints, but there are of course like many other things that one can do to improve mortality uh, or estimation of mortality and one possibility is to include testing statistics. So that means to correct for false positives and negatives and also to correct for testing biases. And we have outlined some of these methods in these two papers that are also available online or already published. So if you're interested in these details, um, please have a look. And now in the second part, as I said, I also want to briefly focus on age structured or infection duration dependent SIR models because um, this also connects um, some more PDE type of modeling to Jacob's work um, on uh, COVID ensemble models. And uh, in contrast to standard SIR models, of course, like age structured models are um, known in the literature for a long time. They were also applied to um, HIV um, spreading problems. And the basic idea is that one introduces another um, time variable tau uh, that Filippo also used in his presentation, the time sense infection. And then we also have an additional clock that um, keeps track of the system time. Uh -huh. And now imagine that we have this additional time variable tau, and then we can also uh, directly model time dependent infectiousness profiles and uh, time sense infection uh, dependent uh, recovery time profiles. And that's quite useful because um, like in contrast to like other modeling attempts like SEIR models where you add an additional compartment to kind of artificially introduce um, additional delays, um, this way of modeling allows you to directly incorporate empirical data. And that's also the distribution that, or like a variation of the distribution that uh, Jacob uses in his models um, or like one of uh, the distributions that he uses in his models. And it's based on a work by He et al. that was published in Nature Medicine last year, uh, which was corrected a few times. That's still based on the first uh, version that appeared online. And you now the general idea is that one can include these um, infectiousness and recovery time profiles into uh, these age structured PDE models. And that's like an example of what these models look like. And they can be solved uh, numerically. That's something that we um, describe in our work on uh, infection duration dependent SIR models and their connection to um, the evolution of mortality measures. And here I'm just showing you like another way of illustrating um, like a simulation we saw that is based on these age structured PDE models where you have the infection duration tau and time t as a tau t space representation of the uh, uh, total number of infected or the density of infected uh, individuals in the population. And we assume the certain, uh, that there's a certain initial cohort that starts um, um, infecting others. And in this simulation here, we also introduced a quarantine effect um, that leads to um, like no new infections after t equals 50. And as I said, like based on such models, it is also possible to study the temporal features or the evolution of different mortality measures, such as the measure M that I mentioned before, the standard CFR, a time delayed CFR, or this quantity here, which is an individual 
mortality measure that doesn't take into account in few patient time defects. And right, that's also the last slide of my presentation. In general, uh, I just wanna again say that for certain jurisdictions, it's quite uh, useful to rely on access staff based mortality monitoring because of these large differences between uh, COVID-19, reported COVID-19 deaths and access deaths. And in principle, it is also possible to correct for testing biases and uh, measurement errors. And again, like if you're interested in more details or like the data or source codes, um, here's a list that um, points you to the relevant literature and repositories. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you, Lucas. Um, a minute for a question, if uh, anybody has. Um, I've got some thoughts, but I wanna leave it to the end. So let's uh, hear from Jacob and we can take a couple questions after Jacob is done. So Jacob, please go ahead. Hey, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So I'm Jacob Bahak, uh, I'm a sole proprietor. Uh, meaning a small business, and I specialize in computational disease modeling. I've been doing it for about 15 years, and uh, I've assembled an, ens an ensemble model. Um, the reason I did this is because uh, I was seeing all those models in the literature. Not all of them are always the same, and they're supposed to represent the same phenomena. So I started with diabetes by making them compete but later on, when COVID came, or even before this, for diabetes, I made them started making them cooperate and compete at the same time. Models for different part, uh, for different uh, things in diabetes. Uh, in diabetes, I've reached, I believe, to be the uh, most validated diabetes model known. Again, small clinical, it is validated in small clinical trials uh, than any other model, as far as I know. Uh, please correct me if you know better. Um, when COVID-19 started, I took the same technology and started applying them to COVID-19. Uh, specifically, the ties with the previous two talks, you will see one mortality model that Filippo uh, reached at the end. This is a mortality that started, as you can see uh, from his presentation, he was, model, he was modeling at levels of cells and uh, individuals, and then eventually you reach the population. So, this is his model, and uh, Lucas. Uh, Lucas's work is mostly for the future. I'm going to talk about it a little bit in the end. But this is the he, his work is integrated here, uh, and I'll show it in the future. I do have several infectious models that I integrated one like the ones that uh, Lucas showed you, but you'll see it later on. So. As far as I know, this is the first multi-scale ensemble model because it goes over multiple scales. And uh, the purpose of the model is unlike many of the models you used to see, is not to forecast. We're actually trying to explain here from all the pieces of knowledge we have, we're trying to build the puzzle of actually what is COVID-19 from multiple aspects. What is its infections, what's mortality rate. We're trying to put all those pieces together. This is what the ensemble uh, tries to do. And the way it tries to do it, it tries to put the pieces together to explain uh, the phenomena observed from April last year to June. This is the extent of the simulation I will, uh, that I'm gonna show you today. So it's pretty early in the pandemic. So it's mostly natural progression of the disease, not that may, much human um, intervention at that point. And therefore, uh, all the models that I'm trying to integrate should uh, explain to some degree what's going on. As you can see, this is an interactive presentation. You can download it from here, or later there'll be a QR code that will help you um, uh, uh, download it. So prepare your phones if you want to download it and interact with it. So this is the COVID-19 uh, uh, model structure. We have four states. It's kind of similar to an SIR model, However, this model is runs uh, uh, micro, on micro simulation, meaning individuals, very similar to agent-based models with very few uh, differences. Um, and uh, therefore the transition are transition probabilities, the one you see here. However, those transition probabilities are governed by multiple equations and actually multiple families of equations. 
we, I have collected multiple infectiousness models, multiple transmission models, um, and multiple response models. Response models are behavioral models, uh, uh, how humans behave mostly, response to the pandemic. There's only one recovery model here. And uh, if you notice, there is no reinfection. It's early in the disease uh, progression. So uh, it's irrelevant for this type of model. Uh, however, we it can be added in the future. Uh, and there are multiple mortality models. There's mortality by age, very, very similar to some of the things Luke is showing, but also there's like, when does the person die if they die? So this is like mortality time models. Those can be integrated together with the H uh, models to figure out when the person dies. But uh, Filippo already done this and he actually created uh, a, mo a model and I'm gonna show it to you interactively later uh, that actually takes and tells you at each point of time what's the probability of that person to die at that, at that day since infection. So this is the last uh, type of model. All of those models or model families are integrated together. Um, the model, uh, uh, the ensemble itself is initialized according to US census data and according to data extracted from uh, uh, the COVID tracking project. The COVID tracking project is also what we validate against from April to June. This is where the information for both uh, validation and initialization starts for because we started uh, April 1st at that day for all uh, 51 states and territories that we modeled here. Uh, there's also uh, information about number of interactions between people. Uh, this is extracted from uh, Del Valle's paper and from Edwin's paper. Uh, you can later on look at the, li uh, uh, at the links and uh, follow exactly where the information was extracted for. But since I have little time, I'm going to just show you uh, um, all those models. So. This is how infectious models look like. Uh, the time since infection in days and the relative infectious uh, according to the max. This is the how much viral load this person is shedding. This comes from multiple, uh, 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 multiple uh, literature pieces, uh, multiple models. You can later follow up and see where it all came from. But uh, I'll show you Lucas's model because he was actually uh, uh, talking about it. So this is his model. This is how it looks like when we implement it. Uh, uh, notice it's similar to one other model that uh, uh, implemented, but you can see that other models that do not look the same. And they come from different observations from different uh, locations. And the question is, which one of them is correct? The disease itself doesn't, change that much like they should be in fact the infections should be the same it, it, it should be should be characterized a certain way maybe different for different people but there should be some sort of profile that on average you can compute so this is one of the things that the, the ensemble will try to do at the end i'm going to leave you in suspense now i'm going to go to the next uh, uh, family of models transmission models once you know uh if, if a person is infected if they interact with other people there is a chance of transmitting disease. It depends on number of encounters, but there's also a probability per encounter. Also, it changes per, geogra uh, per geography. So populations, uh, places that are more uh, densely populated, there's chances that uh, this number should be adjusted. And of course, there's always the chance of someone flies in uh, from a different city or a different country. And uh, therefore there wasn't in the population before and therefore, this is considered to be an outside infection. So those are three parameters that are introduced in transmission models. And um, they have a specific form, I won't go to the, uh, to the math, but uh, you can see I tried four different uh, uh, transmission models. Uh, each one of them has different parameters that govern the equation of how things may look like. Uh, one of them is pretty extreme, uh, we'll see We'll see what happens to it later. Uh, remember, transmission model two is like high transmissiveness. Um, response models are models of behavior. How do people respond to the pandemic? Some people will interact less with people outside, uh, 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 with people, uh, 
will interact less than what they're used to. So, um, and therefore you can account for this just because everyone is worried. But some people continue behaving the same way until they get infected in which situation they might say, okay, once, once I'm sick, maybe now I should start uh, uh, interacting with less people. So for example, behavioral model three is that behavioral model. But there are two other behavioral models and uh, that I used and I used Apple mobility data as some sort of estimator of how much less people are, are actually traveling. And uh, for each day, you can actually figure out uh, what's the, how their interactions level drop. And of course, infected people, they drop and start uh, less and less interactions. So those are two possible response models and variations of those are being used. And as for mortality models, uh, I used mortality rate. Uh, I took information from uh, CDC, both in uh, US and China. Uh, but also I extract information about mortality time. There was one uh, paper that gave some information about this and some information I extracted from the COVID tracking project data by just calculating the first death and assuming this is the time for death since first infection. Uh, and uh, of course there's Filippo's model, you're gonna see it later on, uh, which com it combines both time and uh, probability of the same model. Um, this ensemble is simulated uh, using a lot of computing power because it simulated the agent level, uh, micro simulation, micro level. And each one of those simulations have to be repeated for each population, for each US uh, state or territory used. And it has to be repeated again many times uh, uh, because uh, each time you run the simulation seems stochastic will give you different results. Um, and of course, there's the optimization part, which adds more iterations. So, and of course, you have to run it for all models and variations of those. This is kind of part of the optimization. So it took a lot of computing power and uh, the Midas HPC Center was kind enough to provide this, uh, 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 provide this uh, computing power. And I ran the model uh, for about uh, 48 hours on 22 nodes of 66, 26 cores each, about 1100 cores. About 6.6 of, 6 .6 years of computation on a single machine or with a single CPU. So this is how much computing power it takes to crunch down all those numbers with all those models running in parallel. Um, and before we actually get to the Midas cloud, I had to run it on multiple other um, uh, uh, multiple other times just to build up the simulation. The building up the simulation takes time and does, you have to remove errors and see that things are stable. Uh, for this, I use the Rescale Cloud uh, uh, and uh, funds were provided by the uh, uh, Microsoft Azure and Amazon AWS. Uh, everyone wanted to contribute to understand this disease at the beginning of pandemic and uh, uh, thank you for all those who did. There are more acknowledgements at the end, but those I added to, those were important. The results are displayed in one dashboard like this, and you, it's interactive. You can actually go and explore it. Um, what you see here in this panel is for each state, you can see that for each 10 days, what are the results of the model and compared to what was observed in the, by the COVID tracking project data. So let's take New York, for example. The circle represents after 60 days, what happened in the simulation. Simulation are, in this case is uh, 10,000 people, uh, uh, is for 10,000 people. So you can see 52 deaths were calculated by the model, but also but only 13 uh, uh, were observed. This is the end of May, beginning of June, because it's after 60 days of uh, 1st of April, the simulation started. It's after 50 days, 40 days, and so on and so forth. You can later explore those uh, points if you want. So, the height of the circle here represents not the number, not some sort of number. It's very close to the number of deaths, but it's actually the error between the model results, the model simulation, and the observed numbers. Those are the differences. It's mostly composed of deaths with slight uh, contribution from uh, infections, level, infections level, because those are also compared. Um, 
And the ensemble is the attempt to optimize this number. So those, uh, this arrow should be as low as possible. The fitness should be as close to zero as possible. And this is what we're trying to do and trying to optimize. And the way to optimize is to find the correct mixture, mixture of models in the en ensemble. The way to do it is by starting believing all the models the same level. At the beginning, you don't know much. Everyone tells you something. You don't know who to believe. You say, I believe everyone the same and every model will contribute the same to the ensemble. This is what you see here. You can see the, uh, in this plot, you can see the contributions of each model. You can see the four infectious model in blue. So yeah, the infectious model in blue, the four transmission models in green, uh, the three uh, uh, response models in uh, magenta, I believe, and the rest are mortality models. Those are more complicated to, compl to explain how they are combined, but all of these are uh, parameters of how to combine those models. The ensemble actually combines it this way. At the beginning, everyone is equal. However, after one iteration, if I take only one iteration, you can see the convergence plot here. You can see after one iteration, we already improved fitness considerably. I'll go back to iteration one. You can see the number jump uh, in New York from 40 became almost 10. So it already improved it. Uh, we're trying to improve it even further. So if I drag it along, you will see the system trying to optimize all those ensemble, uh, the ensemble by figuring out the contribution of each one of those models. And Castiglione model, uh, Filippo's model is the last one, last red bar here. Lucas's model is not included in this simulation. It's included in the future simulation. And I'm gonna to try to describe what I'm gonna do in the future. But before, let me show you what I promised. This is the combined infectious model. If you're taking all the infectious models and combine them together like basis functions, this is the infectious that looks like and this is the first iteration when you believe them the same, but in the second, you can see it changes, but then it fluctuates. Assuming that the optimization is actually uh, reached something stable, and this is also debatable, you will see eventually an infectious model that is the most fitting one combined from all of the small pieces of infectious reported by different locations. Um, you can do something very similar to mortality, but as you can see, mortality almost doesn't change. You can see there's a slight fluctuation here between iterations. This is mortality uh, per age. This is the mortality time. It, it's mostly my assumptions here, mortality time from those two models that I was extracted, ex that I extracted. I assume Gaussian distribution. So this is why it looks Gaussian. Um, this is Philippa's model. This is the one that he showed, and I, he allowed me graciously enough to implement it and make it available so everyone can use it. But you can see for each time step in days, you can see the probability of death for each age. So you can actually go and inspect the model and figure out what is the mortality probability according to this model. Um, uh, I want to jump into what I'm gonna talk about in the future. Uh, what I'm going to do in the future, because it's what uh, Lucas is actually contributing now. Uh, look, if you look at this plot, now there are five infectious models. The fifth one is Lucas's model that I implemented. However, this simulation is not complete. It's something, it's a test simulation I'm running on my local machines to make sure things are stable. The more, first of all, I'm happy to include more models. And this is why I'm showing you this. I'm hoping more people will contribute models that can go into the ensemble. So this is why one reason. Another reason is I'm looking for things like Lucas is, uh, Lucas is working on now. Each one of the bars at the end here, the purple ones, are actually human interpretations. Or in this case, uh, Lucas actually had a model of what's the difference between the observed counts of deaths and the actual uh, accounts of death that uh, existed. So he had a model, and this is something that I will be incorporating in the future. Currently, those four are kind of, uh, of my assumptions, but you already sent me some uh, data that I'm planning to incorporate in the future. I'm looking for more of those interpretations because some of the numbers observed by the COVID, COVID tracking project can be underestimated, some can be overestimated, and different models or people have different uh, uh, real, realization of 
what actually happened and they may have conflicting uh, or, or maybe ideas that uh, may cooperate when you put them together may cooperate better. So this is the next stage. And if anyone is interested in contributing interpretations, please talk to me because now there is a difference in those simulations between the observed depths and the actual depths that happen in the simulation. And all of those can be now uh, optimized as part of the model. Um, I would like to conclude and to tell you that the results presented here and later you can download them using those QR code and uh, explore them. The results presented here are, under, are underestimate disease impact. The number of deaths is much, much lower, partially because there are some states that drive, uh, uh, drive the uh, mortality and infections up. This is partially the reason I believe at least at this point. However, I'm continuing working on this uh, the, with the intention to better explain what happened within those two months because once we're able to explain this, the tool can be used potentially for future, uh, uh, for future pandemics or for future uh, uses to explore uh, results like this. Currently, two months are hard to explain. It's, it's hard to tell whether it is possible to explain the period of two months because in two months, many uh, people change the, uh, many, many things. However, hopefully we'll be able to, and the interpretation, human interpretations is one of the mechanisms that I intend to use. And additional models. So if anyone has additional models, please do contact me and uh, send me an email. Um, I'm open for questions if there are any. Okay, great, thank you, Jacob. So uh, I see uh, one hand raised up, uh, David, I'm gonna let, open your mic, so please go ahead and ask uh, your question. Uh, hello? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm curious how different models interact within this ensemble uh, that Jacob has told us about. What, uh, uh, or they just run in parallel to each other. Okay, so how do they interact? They both compete and cooperate. Different, of mm -hmm. both, different models of different categories cooperate. Because mm -hmm. like, if you have like uh, low infectious, high transmission, think about it. It's the same as average yeah. and average. So they, they will cooperate that level. Uh, mm -hmm. And also it's important to say that this technology is really, really only at the beginning because it opens the modeling space that opens when you actually start combining the models is, is basically infinite space in the uh, R, the number of, uh, in the power of the number of models you have. So that's like, it's a, it's a machine learning problem of, of uh, in high dimensionality space of actually how to combine those models. So this is partially, but they also compete because models of the same category cannot, if one of them has more influence, some other model has to give away influence. They kind of compete amongst themselves during optimization. Um, I can show you the plot before, but you will see that the bars, the sum of the bars in the same color will be always one. And it will be, be no, and also another assumption is that the, the models don't lie. Meaning okay. they can, their influence cannot be zero, uh, be, be below zero. But okay. you can extend those technology, those assumptions even further. But there's much more to explore in this technology. This is really, really relatively new. Thank so you. If someone is interested to explore, please talk to me. Thank you. Great. We have time for about one more question if anybody else has anything. I'm not seeing much. Um, and since we're almost at the top of the hour, I think uh, I think we'll probably just leave it at that. Um, thank you guys for a very interesting set of complimentary uh, presentations. And particularly, Jacob, thank you for, for making things so available and, and inviting people to check out your work directly on the interactive web pages. Uh, so I encourage folks to do that. Uh, and thanks to everybody for attending. We will uh, see you in July, in June, excuse me, at the end of June. So thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.